Yesterday, in Abuja, the federal capital, the protest called Hashtag Revolutionary Group met a stonewall by security agencies. Arise News political editor Sumna Sambo monitored the protest as a combined team of police, army and state security officials hounded the protesters and journalists. These Nigerian protesters, inspired by leader of revolution now movement, Omoyele Showere, stormed the streets of Abuja early Wednesday to protest the rising insecurity, corruption and alleged misgovernance. <laughs> But they got a huge shock as the police, soldiers and DSS operatives took them by surprise and hounded them across streets and districts within Abuja, beginning from the Unity Fountain to the Transco Hilton Junction and the Beggar Runabout. We eventually caught up with the Abuja leader of revolutionary protest, Deji Adeonju, who snaked out of hiding to speak with Arise News. The, this is a democracy, this is not a military regime. Uh, you know, these abacha tactics that we are witnessing in the country is very sad, it's unfortunate. You know, and you can see they are telling journalists to leave, uh, leave the place, live here, do this. So it's quite terrible. It's terrible that uh, you know, the government must realize that this is a democracy. The combined team of policemen, soldiers, operatives of the Department of State Service, Hounded the protesters at separate venues and districts. The revolution now protesters kicked against efforts by the Buhari administration to shut their views from public discourse on national issues. Nigeria is currently in a state of emergency. Our country has been reduced to a surrender situation. And we cannot continue like this. And this is the reason why we all have come out today to show our displeasure to let the Nigerian government understand that there's a need for us to have sincere change. If you have a government who has its neck well screwed on its shoulder, if you have a government that is serious about the welfare of the people, by now the service chiefs would have been removed. By now a lot of things would have been overhauled. In Journalists were also not left out, including the Arise News crew, as the convoy of security officials trailed reporters in a bid to prevent them from doing their jobs. Government officials were unwilling to comment on the protests, but the pro Buhari group, the Buhari Media Organization, in a statement commended the police, soldiers, and DSS for foiling the protests, which they claimed was an agenda to push a disruption in the current government using the toga of freedom of speech. Sumner Sambo, Arise News, Abuja. Uh, great, great report there, I should say, from uh, uh, Osama Sambo. Uh, what's your take on this, Dr. Abati? Well, quickly, um, yesterday we uh, reported this as breaking news on yes. the uh, Arise News channel. I think that uh, many Nigerians are concerned that uh, this was a peaceful protest, and characteristically, uh, the uh, security agencies uh, descended on the protesters uh, who belong to a group called Revolution Now, led by Omoyele Shure and others, with their orange-colored uh, caps and their insistence that uh, many things are wrong with Nigeria that government needs to address. The protest of the Revolution Now movement is basically about the economic and security conditions in Nigeria, issues on which there is a meeting of minds among all, all Nigerians, uh, whether they are working for government or they are out of government, wherever they may be. Now, you recall that when this revolutionary, uh, revolution now movement started, Shure and others, including Bakare from Oshun State and others, Agba Jalingo, you know, they were all arrested and taken to court. Eventually, their lawyers uh, succeeded in getting them out on bail. But now, a few months later, uh, the same movement has said, look, it's back at the trenches. And yesterday, in Lagos, in Abuja, in Oshobo, and other parts of Nigeria, uh, they mobilized to have uh, a protest. Now, the security agencies also came out in full force to uh, engage them. Now, what are the issues that have emerged in terms of uh, the reactions? One, has been established that there was the excessive use of force and that that was not necessary, considering the fact that these were unarmed protesters. Two, it has been established that the protesters were su subjected to torture. 
which in itself is a violation of their fundamental human rights. That gentleman that is uh, or, or that was shown on the screen just now, uh, he had dreadlocks. We were told that security agents used a uh, uh, bottle, broken bottles, to shave his head. The last time we had that in Nigeria was with the case of Minere Amakiri in Port Harcourt, who published an uncomplimentary uh, uh, editorial on a day the, go the then governor of uh, that state was having his birthday. And the governor at that time was Alfred uh, Dietes Piff, who is now a monarch uh, in uh, River State. So that, of course, is unacceptable because the Constitution of Nigeria guarantees the dignity of the human person uh, in Section 34 thereof. And for you to violate the dignity of anybody, you know, torturing journalists, asking them to lie down, beating them with horse whips. In fact, some of them were beaten with chains. Now, that's unacceptable. Then, of course, the fundamental rights still along that line. I mean, any Nigerian at all is free to assemble, is free to associate, is free to express opinion. All of these rights were violated by the security agencies uh, in their reaction uh, to those uh, revolutionary protesters. And many of them were detained. We understand that in Lagos, uh, the ones that were detained yesterday have been released. And we call on government to ensure that all the other ones that have been detained across Nigeria, either in Lagos or Shubu or Port Harcourt, should also be released. Because the right to protest is a human right. And uh, in this case, uh, even Arise News journalists were involved. Arise News journalists were also harassed and intimidated by security agencies. Now, if you want to flip it, you may now say, well, uh, Huriwa, Human Rights uh, Writers of Association of Nigeria, um, Amnesty International, uh, SERAP, Social Economic Responsibility uh, and Accountability uh, Project, which is an NGO, they've all protested on the along the lines of fundamental human rights. Uh, Uriwa says what has been done to these protesters what is, in fact, provocative and that it could turn Nigerians against the government. But let's flip it a little bit. If you look at the leaders of this uh, group, Omoyele Shoure, uh, Bakari, Agbajalingo, and some others, these are persons who are on bail, on court bail, for this same reason of uh, protesting revolution now. Mm. And the bail has conditions. Now, I'm not aware that the conditions include the fact that revolution now can continue to engage the Nigerian government in terms of protests. Mm. So you could say that there is provocation on both sides. Because if you take on the state and you're on bail, I mean, they could come back and say you have violated your bail and that the security agencies have a responsibility to make sure that you do not repeat the offensive. But that's something for us to uh, debate, you know. Uh, so on both sides, there are issues uh, that will be raised. But I hope that the protesters will be released on the fundamental human rights side of it. All right, uh, so that's all on the news. It's a pity you, you can I give a comment on that at this well. We'll take a short break now, and when we return, we'll have the trio of Rotus Odiri, Marco Wilson, and Aaron Akiri to give us updates on Africa, global business, and COVID-19. Please stay with us. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Joining us now is Rotus Odiri with Africa Business Update. Good morning, Rotus. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning, Adesua. Good morning. And uh, good morning, Rufai. So we kick, things off, <laughs> we kick things off with uh, exports, talking about how to diversify exports, how to get more of those items out there in order to get the much needed foreign exchange that Nigeria needs. Coco, FDC, financial derivatives company, put out a uh, report uh, that uh, says that, uh, here it is, um, the black pod disease, which is a fungal disease, could affect up to 40% of Nigeria's cocoa output. Uh, and it thrives under excess rainfall. Now, this is coming at a bad time because um, cocoa prices, as you can see there, were up by 17.57% over the last five weeks to 2455 
uh, uh, per metric uh, per metric ton. All right. So essentially, if you look at how much Nigeria made uh, from cocoa exports in uh, 2019, it was approximately it was about 698, 699, but approximately 700 million uh, dollars from cocoa exports in 2019, and we ex exported approximately 280,000 metric tons. So um, if this was to spread, there would be trouble. Another thing that Nigeria has to look out for is competition from Cameroon. So we're looking at the top five uh, cocoa exporters here. And I should point out that this is 2017 data from the UNFAO, the United Nations Food and Agriculture uh, Organization. So of course, Ivory Coast is number one, Ghana is number two. Uh, you can see Nigeria there at, uh, at number four, Cameroon at number five. Cameroon, though, is threatening to deep, uh, you know, remove Nigeria from the fourth spot as a result of the fact that they are looking to export about 285,000 metric tons calendar year 2020 going into 2019 going into 2021. And here's the interesting thing. Cameroon borders Nigeria on the eastern side, right? We all remember the Bakasi issues we had in the past and so on and so forth. But most of Nigeria's cocoa production is on the southwest. So, you know, with, what, with the kind of production coming from Cameroon side of, of where we are, the entire southern region of Nigeria should actually be looked as uh, possible potential, I have to be careful to say this, possible potential fertile ground for cocoa exports. Of course, you know, part of that goes to the Niger Delta, there's the issues of pollution and so on and so forth. However, again, southwest is where most of the production comes from. Cameroon borders us on the southeast, so we're looking at possibly having, we have the potential to increase our cocoa production. And, you know, as everyone knows, you know, with cocoa, you look at the chocolate industry, we're not really getting as much as we, we should be getting uh, from what chocolate sales worldwide yet. Africa is, you know, the, the, the belt that produces most of the cocoa that goes, gets out of the country. So we hope that the, the, the black fungal disease doesn't actually spread and actually, you know, affect our output because it would not be good considering these times when we need as much um, of our export dollars as, as possible. Uh, moving on to the debt management office, uh, you were just talking at the top of the show about uh, your discussion on Chinese loans. The DMO released uh, an, a press release, uh, put out a press release yesterday saying that they've been listening to all the chatter that's been going on with regards to the um, nervousness around uh, Nigerians, you know, nervousness around w w what, we owe the ch what we owe China. So they decided to put out some data. So they said as of Q1 2020, March the 31st of this year, total loans uh, from China to Nigeria uh, came out to $3.1 billion. Now, um, the language they use are like, well, this is only 3.94% of Nigeria's total public debt, which is at $79.3 billion. And there's a concessional rate of 2.5%. The tenor is 20 years. The moratorium is uh, uh, seven years. Moratorium being that we have seven years to pay it off. And these are project tied loans, 11 in total. The issue here, though, is that, and we talked about this when the Minister of Transportation, Rutsumi Amechi, was talking about these loans on a television program. It was a little confusing because when he talked about the concession rate of 2.5% and the tenor of 20 years and the moratorium of seven years, he seemed to be referring to the $500 million loan that the Good Luck Jonathan administration got um, in 2019, October 2019. And that $500 million was a subset of an $894 million loan. So this stuff is kind of murky. I mean, the, 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 the DMO needs to give us a little more detail and if you go to their website, they said, of course, you should go to the website and take a look uh, at um, these loans. But it's, it's too general. And so there's a little bit of a conflation here. They're saying it's the total amount. But, you know, again, uh, uh, what Rotimi Arichi was saying was that it was kind of referring to the $500 million loan for the Abuja Kaduna rail line. Also, I do need to correct something. When, on, when we talked about this last time, I took what he said at face value, that the um, immunity clause would only refer to the assets that were being built, the infrastructure assets that were being built with regards to all the, 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 the talk about the nervousness of China taking over. He said China can only, if we default on the loan, can only take uh, possession of those particular assets. And that's not entirely correct. If you take a loan, and I think your guest, that, um, your, your, your guest uh, that, from Azura, the, the MD of Azura uh, Power, spoke about this as well. 
if you take a loan, you don't really have the choice to say, okay, you can only seize this asset or that. They can pretty much take what they want. Um, so that's what's going on with the DMO. We kind of need a little more clarity, but they've put the numbers out there with regards to what we owe in total. Uh, but there's still the issue of debt sustainability. Remember, it was uh, debt, uh, we debt the service to revenue ratio was 99% Q1. It came down to about 79% Q2. That is the portion of your income that goes towards settling debts. Uh, 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 topic number three, story number three, ShopRite came up in the headlines again. This time they uh, put out a notice that they are exiting Kenya. Said here, endeavor to continue trading at the Nyali branches in Mombasa is no longer viable. Financial and other data will be provided and discussed at the proposed meeting. It is contemplated that the intended date of termination, that is, Shoplight exiting this uh, Mbala store, Mombasa store, uh, is August the 31st of 2020. It says there are currently 115 persons employed at the branch, of which 92 are KUCFs, KUCFW members. This is the Kenya Union of Commercial Food and Allied Workers. They sent the notice to them. So you can see this is very specific that they are closing down this particular store, the jobs that will be affected, and they are leaving. They had four stores. They only have about two now after August. If you take a look at the Kenya struggles, which we put out there, their operations outside of South Africa, this is ShopRite, contributing about 20% to their profit. Uh, they exited Mauritius in 2018, exited Tanzania in 2019 due to unprofitability. This same unprofitability is why they are leaving this particular Kenya store. Again, they opened their first Kenya store in 2018, four in total. Uh, this particular store, a location um, they, okay, they closed their last location in just in May, just about four months ago. And then this second location is now being closed as of uh, August the, the 31st. So to see the difference now between Nigeria and Kenya, this is specific. This is to the union saying these are the jobs that will be lost. This is the time we're going to be leaving. We are closing shop. We're going as opposed to as opposed to Nigeria. Okay, so that's what Rotus, quickly, I want to talk about Coco. It's, it's quite very sad when I saw those numbers there. I think those are 2017 numbers, 328,000 uh, metric tons. Right. Let me shock you. Let me spin this number to you. As at 1970, 1971, Nigeria did 310,000 metric tons of cocoa. Right. So in over 40 years, we have just been able to add minus 310 minus 328, that's just 18,000 metric tons. Right, in so that I, period. In 40 years, right. in over four. It's Probably, quite very sad. It, it is. The Dutch course, as well, they say. I think the explanation for that will probably be our monocultural economy. The fact that Nigeria moved away from agriculture and just focused on uh, oil. oil wealth. Right. So it's the cost of oil Dutch uh, part of it. Dutch well, disease. Dutch disease. Let Thank me you. let me uh, uh, you know take you up on the uh, DMO and the explanation that it has offered with regard to uh, Chinese loans. I mean, I'm very happy that you are skeptical about the explanation that the Department of uh, the Debt Management Office has offered because they offered the same explanation in September 2018. They repeated the same explanation in March 29, uh, 2020. And they have repeated the same explanation now in uh, August 2020, which makes their explanation suspicious. And, you know, it's something that we need to interrogate further. Uh, they say it's 3.1 billion, it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, just about 11.5 percent of our total budget and the, the uh, uh, total borrowings, and that they have uh, uh, a sustainable plan in place to make sure that uh, the, the repayment plan uh, is in order. But we need to ask questions. Can they make those agreements public mm. so that all of us can interrogate what is there? And then the DMO claims that uh, they have not violated uh, Section 41, uh, 41 uh, subsection 1 of the uh, Financial right. Responsibility Act. Right. Now, that is not true, mm. you know, and it's something on which we can uh, yeah, look at uh, engage them. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, moving on to the business, uh, to more, for more business update with Michael Wilson, all the way from London, England. Good morning, Michael. Good morning. Um, they're calling it a sort of buy everything trade at the moment. That's what uh, dealers are doing. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. If it's got a pulse, somebody actually said, um, let's buy it. It's uh, quite extraordinary what's going on. Um, but uh, Asia was relatively cautious. Nikkei eased by about half a percent on the on some rather disappointing earnings. The U.S. rhetoric on banning Chinese apps weighed on the Shanghai Composite at down about one percent. Also, a, a yuan, the Chinese currency, slightly stronger. Uh, retail sales are weak there. Hong Kong actually followed what happened in mainland China, falling nearly one and a half percent yesterday. Singapore rallied slightly. Kuala Lumpur and Malaysia are also higher by 
0.5 and 0.7% respectively. So, again, not a, not an enormous amount going on. Um, the latest I have from the UK, I'll give you more detail, is that the Bank of England left rates unchanged. Uh, that was announced at uh, 7 o'clock our time, 7 o'clock your time, and also the UK downturn, not as severe as it is thought, but it'll take us longer to recover. I'll give you more detail of that later. So basically, overall, a um, lot of mixed signals, really. Equities in Europe and the US pushed higher yesterday. Um, bullish sentiment. You see, this is I don't understand this, but people are still buying, and they still think there's going to be a, an agreement fairly soon with the US stimulus package. We're only 100 days away, for heaven's sake, from an election in the United States. States, but uh, there's still a lot of talk going on between Republicans and, De Republicans and Democrats. And uh, the dealers are cautiously optimistic that some kind of um, deal will be actually made. There's a general feeling about compromise. Um, now, here's an interesting thing. Uh, today, I'll be talking with Rotus later about the, the weekly jobless figures, but the ADP employment report um, took a lot of uh, traders by surprise. The, the message from it was incredibly complicated. 167,000 jobs added, nowhere near the one and a half million that economists had been inspecting, but it was met with shock because the June figure, and so we go on and on and on, it gets revised and revised and revised. However, a bit of arithmetic showed, finally, at the end of the day, there's about 4.5 million jobs had been created. So that was the message in the United States that uh, traders actually took away. And um, as I said, um, the likelihood of an election, the likelihood of the stimulus plan being agreed in the United States appears to be slightly greater, given that this deadline of the election is approaching. UK, uh, if I can speak domestically, we'll give you the Bank of England in a second, but rushing to um, secure a post-Brexit trade deal with Japan, uh, not a huge boost for what's happening in the UK. Cars and services are still a big sticking point. Just to give you an idea, if it were to happen, then um, imports from Japan here would increase by 80 percent our exports to Japan would only increase 21 percent um, but that's uh, that's the way things are so to the Bank of England then uh, interest rates um, left at 0.1 percent downturn not quite as severe as initially thought but it'll take longer to for the economy to get back to pre-covid size now by the end of next year 2021 uh, my question is it might get back to the size but what kind of shape is it actually going to be in? And that, of course, is something which we won't know for some time. Unemployment will peak at 7.5% by the end of the year. And any talk about negative interest rates once again was pushed aside slightly. What they're saying about that is they understand the damage that could be done by negative interest rates to the banking community. So at the moment, it's very much uh, wait and see. Um, Last month, the chief economist of the Bank of England said that uh, uh, the, 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 the economy had recouped a lot of the ground it had lost between June and April. Again, a very, very complicated picture, all this, but that's life, isn't it, really? Um, BOE sort of. Of, um, taking a wait-and-see attitude, and we'll hear from the Governor of the Bank of England when he gives his news conference at 12.30, your time and our time, and I'll be talking about that with Rotus uh, later this afternoon. Um, PMI reports, yet back to yesterday again, good ones from Spain, Italy, France, Jim. I say good, good in comparison to the terrible news. The French reading, and anything above 50% is good. The French reading was 57.3, and the most impressive of the bunch, and the French economy apparently is growing at its quickest pace uh, for 16 months. I found that incredibly, but there we are. Um, now, precious metals, gold, another huge record yesterday, well above the $2,000 an ounce um, uh, level, and silver, too, hitting a new seven year high. Um, this is all helped by uh, the compression of government bond yields and also the fact that the dollar is weak. Oil, here's a good one, hit its highest level since March driven by inventory reports. On Tuesday, the API announced that U.S. stockpiles dropped by 8.6 million barrels, while the consensus was a decline of 3 million. So that means that um, uh, that, that constriction uh, will help the oil market, although yesterday saw a little bit of profit taking between, the world, uh, between West Texas Intermediate and Brent. And I would completely concur with Rotus when he was talking about the grain market and so on. Watch those soft commodities. Not a lot of movement yesterday, but I think cocoa, grain, and the rest of them are going to show big movements in, in the weeks to come. That's the global view. Well, uh, Michael, two quick questions. What is the optimism of the uh, Bank of England based upon? Is it the increase in uh, spending 
You know, the government says spend, spend, spend uh, to accelerate economic recovery. Or is this uh, as a result of the general easing of the uh, lockdown? I know you sounded a bit skeptical about the rate or shape uh, of the recovery of the UK uh, economy. And then secondly, I mean, there is a, a paradox that we seem to be dealing with in the context of COVID-19, which is the fact that the uh, stock market uh, here and there appears uh, quite exuberant uh, in the face of economies that uh, are collapsing and uh, suffering. What, what is the explanation for that? Right. For, to, to take your second point first, we call it FOMO. The, it's a, it's a, um, it's a, uh, it, it's it's the initials of fear of missing out. It's a, it's a sort of phrase that that, uh, it, and it was put to me this morning earlier on that anything that's got a pulse, people are actually buying it right, right now. Um, there is an irregularity about that, but rem I would say that the stock market is is always looks forward. It takes what it's got from the past, but it does look forward. And I think a lot of people do not want to be left out when they see economies rising more quickly, because the one thing about prediction is it is usually wrong. That's that's about my scepticism. Over the years, most of the predictions I've ever seen have been wrong completely. We may get out of this more quickly. Secondly, my scepticism about the Bank of England is simply this. They're taking a slightly less severe view about what goes on, but I still know that the kind of jobs in this country that existed before COVID, and remember, it's only like seven months ago, really, are not going to be around. And we have a, we have a lot of service industry employment in this country. Those jobs are just not going to be there. So I think Things will they, they may well appear to have grown very, very quickly, but what the figures do not take into account is the long-term unemployed in the country, which is the same for most developed economies, and secondly, the level of the service industry, which is quite high. I don't think those jobs will return. I certainly am going out for the first time any distance, probably at some stage next week, and my, my fellow Londoners are doing exactly the same, They're proceeding very, very cautiously indeed, and they are certainly not spending, and if they are... It's online. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, for that. Uh, for update on COVID-19 pandemic, Aaron Akiri Jola is here with us. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning to you, Rafai. Good, good morning, morning Aaron. To you, Doctor. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And I did say well, good morning. And let's get straight to it. Maybe this is good news. Um, but I might not be seeing it as good news, nevertheless. But let's get into it. But before we get into the news, because we hear that um, there was a meeting, massive meeting yesterday between the vice president, uh, the presidency generally, which involved also the minister of health here in Nigeria, and the BioNTech Pfizer team, which should be good news as they have discussed the development and distribution of a vaccine when it is ready. This be, seems to be a very good news, and it seems to be a step understanding that Nigeria has been in the back ends in terms of talking about vaccines, with the fact that clinical trials are being done in Africa. As a matter of fact, Nigeria is not part of it because they didn't sign any clinical trial deal with WHO, certainly. So they are even on the back behind with the likes of South Africa, Egypt, participating with a clinical trial from the, from the, from the AstraZeneca trials that have been going on for quite a while right now. But before we come in, before we come into this, let's look at the world figures as it stands right about now. At the moment, we have over 18 million 814,178 confirmed cases of COVID-19 at the moment, with over 700,000 deaths as we speak. Now, but let's bring it to Africa to actually bring it to context as things are actually going on. As a matter of fact, right now, we are getting closer. And they said before Saturday, we might be up to as, as many as 1 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Africa, which is very, very worrisome. We know that the WHO team have arrived in South Africa to help them combat what is going on in South Africa because things are really, really picking up in South Africa. There's a massive uptick in number of cases recorded in South Africa. And right now, we're hoping that the WHO, with their expertise, will be able to give a little bit of guardians and give a little bit of suggestion on how to curb the spread of this virus. Hoteng region is blowing up at the moment. The lockdowns are not working. The ban on alcohol is not working in South Africa, which is quite worrisome. Now, coming back to that talk about the meeting that actually happened yesterday between the federal government 
and the BioNTech and Pfizer team. Now, the German from manufacturer is talking about BioNTech and Pfizer, who are based in New York, are hoping, they've, they've told Nigeria not to worry, that they will be prioritized in terms of distribution of vaccine. And that was the official statement put out there. But I do not believe that because at the moment, they already have backlog of orders. As a matter of fact, they are actually doing clinical trials in the US, they're doing in Argentina, they're doing in Germany, they're doing in Brazil. And when vaccines come out, first priority goes to those places where they had done clinical trials. We know that the US has ordered the very first 100 million doses from this particular company or this consortium of companies. And as it stands right now, the UK has also ordered from Pfizer also. And I don't know, Nigeria hasn't put any money on ground. So when they say Nigeria will be priority, I, I, I simply, maybe won't take that with a pinch of salt. Maybe it's a political statement being put out there. Maybe they're just trying to get people excited. But at the moment, reality still stands that that, will not, that is not a reality because people are putting out monies. Canada are looking for a way with billions being invested, are looking for a way to get up in the least and it's even difficult at the moment because the UK, Germany, and the US have dominated most of the list for those that are leading in vaccines. And Nigeria is even nowhere to be found. But moving away from that, let's actually look at what some good news that is actually coming. Okay, before then, Pfizer actually put out a statement that we actually brought on the screen, which actually showed the progression that is happening. Remember, phase two and phase three clinical trials are still going on in Brazil, in Germany, in the US, and uh, and also in the UK. So let's see how things actually go. They've actually broken it down and they keep insisting that they're committed to ensuring the safest and the best vaccine that will be put out there. But let's see, it's still the award against, against the wards and let's see how things actually go. Moving away from this right now, some good news is actually coming in. In April, the US President Donald Trump promised Ethiopia that they will be supporting their fight against COVID-19 and they will be giving them ventilators. And yesterday, those ventilators, 250 state-of-the-art ventilators arrived in Ethiopia yesterday and were handed to the country uh, through, the minister, through the Minister of Health in that particular country, and which is actually good because it only just bolsters what the U.S. has been doing there as they've invested billions into the healthcare system of Ethiopia, and this is another move to just help strengthen that particular place. Looking at how things are actually playing out in terms of Africa and COVID-19, you find out that Ethiopia also are also having a lot of numbers, 20,336. They might not, it might not be as much as Egypt, Nigeria, Ghana, Algeria, Morocco, but nevertheless, Ethiopia has seen a massive rise in numbers. So this is very, very timely. 250 state-of-the-art ventilators are actually coming to Africa. Now, trying to take it further, moving on to the next slide. At the moment, there have been talks about vaccine, I mean, ventilators, and you can see the number of ventilators each country actually has at the moment. This was done by, this survey was done on the 17th of April, and it actually just shows the number of ventilators actually in the entirety of the continent. And uh, you can see Nigeria, as at the 17th of April, had 169 ventilators to cater for how many people? We are well over 200 million people, and we just only have actively working is 169 ventilators. And if we have a massive or a critical case like we've seen in the U.S., that means there will be more deaths than ever before. And um, moving on to the next one, it also shows the rest, of, the rest of the countries and how many ventilators are in Africa. We do need ventilators just in case because there are talks that the virus has not peaked in Africa. And towards the end of the year, we might be, see, we might be seeing a massive upsurge, just like what is happening in South Africa right now. And they said that if it has happened in South Africa, it's likely to happen across the plane. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, I just want okay. you go first. Well, Aaron, yeah. it was in, uh, the Nigerian government has based this optimism of being uh, giving priority on the size of the country as the largest on the continent. Um, but I think that the message this time around should be that we should, you know, uh, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Absolutely. And that's because it is over ambitious for anyone to think that even when a vaccine is ready, it will get to everyone. And so I think our message should be uh, preventative measures. Right. Uh, you know, this non-pharmaceutical intervention 
how well are we taking it? That should be the drive. Because even the top infectious diseases experts across the world, yeah. including WHO, have said, you know, this virus is going nowhere. You know, at best, the vaccine will help us control it, but it will be here for a very long time. So we should be thinking of a plan B. If we do not get that vaccine, what's the option left to us? A long time. I think that uh, getting on the pre-order list for vaccines is also uh, a good strategy. And I was going to disagree with you uh, about your pessimism, uh, Aaron. <laughs> I think that the federal government of Nigeria should be commended for finally waking up and trying to get onto the uh, pre-order list. In this regard, with two companies, Pfizer and uh, Biotech. Now, in the case of Pfizer, the Pfizer representative in Nigeria is even a Nigerian. Mm -hmm. And it was the one assuring uh, 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 Vice President Yemi Oshimbajo, who is leading, who led the teleconference yesterday, that Nigeria will be prioritized. I don't have any doubt in that regard, considering the fact that Niger Nigeria is a big market. Don't forget that this is a country of uh, 200, uh, over 200 million people. So we have an advantage in that regard. And for the Nigerian government to wake up, uh, I think it's a good uh, sign. Now, secondly, uh, this is uh, at the level of government to company relations. Mm. I think that uh, President Oshimajo's team should move a step further and also engage at bilateral levels because those big pharmaceutical companies all are also involved in the politics of COVID-19. And as you know, there is a bilateral dimension to it, you know, which uh, Nigeria can key into. As for Ethiopia and the uh, U.S., yes, no problem, but we should worry more about uh, President Trump. Uh, misinforming the public and leading <laughs> Facebook and Twitter to apply the bricks yesterday mm. against them. Uh, but talk, again. Uh, oh, quickly, <laughs> just to mention this here, I'm just speaking based on facts because as it stands right now, their allegiance, even though okay. they are talking to Nigeria and saying this to Nigeria, their allegiance okay. based on hard dollars is somewhere okay. else okay. and but not close to Africa. Thank at the you. Moment. Thank you so much. You're speaking on facts.